Welcome to the fourth session of the Tech Strand, uh, the Tech Dilemma Strand at the Battle of Ideas Festival. This one is called Online Safety versus Free Speech. My name is Jan McVarish, and I'm the Education and Events Director of the Free Speech Union. Uh, and we're delighted to partner with the Battle of Ideas on this session. The Free Speech Union was set up two and a half years ago by uh, Toby Young here. And uh, I would give a plug for us as we're partnering on the session. Um, if you want to know more about us, you can pick up a leaflet and you can join very easily using the QR code or go to our website and find out what we do and why you should join us. So I'm guessing you'll have a pretty good idea of what the session is about based on the, on the title uh, and from the information that was there in the programme. Uh, so we have a piece of legislation, the Online Safety Bill, whose supporters in government aspire to make the UK the, the safest place in the world to go online. So that's excellent for focusing, focusing our attention on some of the very big issues about the internet and social media in particular. But we don't have to limit ourselves to the bill, although this is the opportunity uh, over the course of the weekend to explore it uh, in, in detail with a panel of experts. So I'll do my best though to ensure that those of you uh, who are not legal experts or tech experts like me uh, can have a, a, an accessible discussion and uh, we can ask panel to explain things in layman's terms where necessary. So I'm really delighted to introduce my panel. We have uh, Charles Colville, who's a crossbench peer in the House of Lords, a former member of the uh, House of Lords Communications and Digital Select Committee, and also a freelance television producer who's worked for the BBC, Channel 4, Channel 5, and some of the US channels, including CNN. And then we have Molly Kingsley, who's co-founder of Us For Them, a campaign group set up by concerned parents in response to the effects of chil of, on children of the pandemic. Uh, she's the co-author of the book, uh, The Children's Inquiry, How the State and Society Failed the Young During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And then we have Toby Young, founder and general secretary of the Free Speech Union, author of How to Lose Friends and Alienate People, <laughs> associate editor of The Spectator, and a crucial area of the Free Speech Union's legislative and campaigning work has focused on the online safety bill. Uh, you will find our briefings on our website and um, giving you lots of background information about the, about the bill. And then we have Paddy Hannam, who is a researcher in the House of Commons. He's also a writer and a commentator, uh, working previously at Spiked and The Spectator. And he stood as a Brexit Party candidate in 2019 against Emily Thornberry in Islington. Uh, and then finally, we have Graeme Smith, who you may have seen on the previous panel here. Uh, he's a tech and internet lawyer in private practice. He's the editor and main author of the textbook Internet Law and Regulation, and I highly recommend. <laughs> oh, you waved it. You're waving that. I'm really, really impressed. <laughs> you, you win the prize for the biggest book of the weekend. Um, if you don't want to read that book, I would recommend Graham's uh, blog, which is called Cyber Legal, uh, for an incredibly in-depth but very accessible discussion of the complex issues involved in the uh, in the regulation of the internet. And just to, I'm going to start with a quick quote from, from Graham's blog, where he wrote about the bill. He said, the bill has the feel of a social architect's dream house, an elaborately designed, exquisitely detailed, eventually, expensively constructed, but ultimately uninhabitable showpiece. A showpiece, moreover, erected on an empty foundation, the notion that a legal duty of care can sensibly be extended beyond risk of physical injury to subjectively perceived speech harms. So I'll just throw that out to uh, get your juices flowing, so to speak, before I hand over to Charles. Hi, good afternoon. Wow, what an audience. Um, uh, during my membership of the House of Lords Communications uh, Digital Select Committee, the concern over the extraordinary power of the tech platforms prompted us to publish four reports on digital regulation. Uh, this was well before the publication of Shoshana Zuboff's book, Surveillance Capitalism and also the revelations of, of how Facebook worked by the, the whistleblower Francis Hogan, and since then the numerous other revelations about the operations of these platforms. It's become clear that the major platforms have set up business models which prioritize and disseminate content, not for the good of the users, but to increase their engagement with the platform. To do this by, by engaging at the most visceral level, making sure appealing to their, to their sense of fear, fury, and greed in order to capture their eyeballs for as long as possible and maximize the revenue generated for the platforms. It's also become clear that all users were treated equally, whatever their age, 
Access to all content for under 18s was in many platforms supposedly controlled by, by the most cursory of ID checks. But it soon becomes very clear that even young users can circumvent this. The resulting damage to our children and young people from exposure to pornography and abusive content is seen by many people, including myself, as unacceptable. You've only got to read the report by the coroner on the 14-year-old Molly Russell case to understand the full ghastly effects of this free fall on the internet. He's called for separate adults and children platforms, age verification, use of algorithms to provide content, parental control of access to materials viewed by the child. The online safety grid is an attempt to address these harms caused to both young and adult digital users. Instead of mandating content which should be taken down, as happened in Germany with the Next DG Act, which had a disastrous effect on free speech, including making political martyrs out of the far-right AFD party when their websites were taken down for contravening the bill. This bill is an attempt to work with tech companies to ensure that they change their algorithms on disseminating content online with mutually agreed levels of risk. At the moment, talking to former tech, com tech company uh, executives, they tell me of the sort of endless efforts by lobby companies and politicians to influence the algorithms, to influence what content goes online, to prioritize or to suppress that content, mainly in, in favor of what they agree with. Very often these are attempts to suppress content from their political opponents, which they label as extremist. Sometimes it is extremist, breaks laws or doesn't, or doesn't need to be taken down. But very often it's just a free for all which leaves the platforms deciding what to take down, what to do prioritize, who to block. The appeal system is also controlled by the platforms and doesn't leave much room for objectivity. We need to have some order and accountability for the biggest tech platforms in the world and the only safety bill is at least an honest attempt to try and do that. I hope that most of you will agree that it's right to protect our young people for exposure to pornography and abusive uh, content, protect them from those harms and to ensure that, that companies are put, in, uh, put into effect age assurance schemes to enforce that. In California, new state laws are reinforcing ID by looking at the user's history from which they can apparently infer their age. In this country, um, we don't think that's a completely secure method of verification. We want to set up an, a specific age verification ID process, which has a more assured and safer way of confirming the age of user, uh, the young users. On top of that, companies need to do a risk assessment in line with, off with Ofcom guidance to limit harmful content appearing to children. I think this is a satisfactory, albeit not foolproof, way of trying to limit their harm. We need to look at the nature of that content um, and, and, who, and what should they should be sheltered from, it's, but it's a very difficult problem. I suggest that self-harm and suiciding enab enabling websites should be illegal. I know that many posts of teenagers who cut themselves are often <coughs> cries for help, but every effort must still be made to ensure that those posts are not disseminated and don't go viral. They should be taken down. Maybe the algorithm can refer those, those users to the, other, to the Samaritans or other relevant charities. As for the, the adult harms on its bill, we're already seeing platforms carry out their own moderation. As you know, this is done by algorithms and then checked in some cases by humans, but it's also often very unsatisfactory. Look at Facebook's limitation and Twitter's banning of the Hunter Biden Ukraine corruption story, uh, which, which happened in America. It, 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 it turned out actually to be a rather important story and shouldn't have been taken down. The bill asks the, the biggest platforms to fill out a risk, ass risk assessment so that, they, so that they look at how they can limit the harms to users. We could just leave it to them, but anybody I've spoken to who has worked with the company says that they would apply the loosest possible terms. They all say, and Francis Hogan, the Facebook whistleblower, has confirmed it, that whenever company lawyers are asked about limiting access to content, they'll always ask, what does the law say about that, and what does the law require of us? Without the force of law to ensure a consistent application of the risk assessment, little with change, and the present chaotic and arbitrary system will continue. I understand the government has delayed the bill. One reason is they might want to take out the legal but harmful clauses, which are so controversial and so worrying for many on free speech. I would support a change on these clauses. They're vague, and they leave far too much power in the hands of ministers. However, the ambition to force tech companies to behave responsibly, and with that to be mandated by a regulator, is essential and should be part of the bill. The, the law will, go, will, will give a lot of leeway to the platforms in the way that they decide to do the risk assessments. Some will feel that they, that they, that they want to, have, to be free to have open adult content. Others will want a more family-friendly public square. The important thing is that users know what sort of forum they're getting into when they subscribe 
and that there's recourse to a regulator if they feel that the risk assessment hasn't been applied. As the Joint Committee on the Bill suggested, it needs, it needs to incorporate an Ofcom mandatory safety by, de by design code of practice, setting out the steps providers will need to take to properly consider and mitigate risks. These should include risks created by virality and frictionless sharing of content at scale, mitigated by measures to create friction to slow down viral content and clamp down on fake accounts and bots, but also that providers identify and mitigate reasonably foreseeable risk of harm arising from a range of activities, which could include inciting violence against racial minorities and threatening posts which uh, lead a reasonable person to feel that they could be afraid that they'd be carried out and content which promotes eating disorders, and I said, and as I said before, self-harm. Um, and I, actually, I think we should consider disinformation which undermines our electoral system. Otherwise, I, I'm pretty open with disinformation. I think it's up to the platforms to try and rectify that um, and other users. There are, there, are, there are laws which restrict certain free speech offline. We need to match these when looking at the digital regulation. However, there will be clauses in the bill protecting the democratic process and journalism although the definition of journalism is, is yet to be decided, all of which are guaranteed by the Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. I've been a journalist all my life, and I'm a great supporter of free speech. However, although I do admire much of the content of this bill, I do hope that any changes to legal but harmful clauses will severely restrict the Secretary of State's almost limitless and unaccountable powers to censor content. These radical powers need to be mitigated by involving Parliament in these decisions, possibly as a joint committee on this bill. If we're going to limit free speech online, then we need to make sure that our elected representatives are in the middle of evolving that decision. I'm sure that we'll hear that, hear that any limitation on adult content by the bill will infantilize people. But having heard evidence from many, many people about the terrible damage and the all, from the all-powerful internet, it seems only right that we should allow, that we allow people to be protected from the worst excesses of the most powerful information, in, uh, inform information medium ever invented. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> and to Molly. Hi. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm one of the founders of a group called Us For Them. Um, we are a parent group. We were set up um, right at the beginning of the pandemic and I guess we pride ourselves in taking on battles um, for children and for children's safety but taking on battles that other people won't touch um, and I guess that gives um, me kind of a unique vantage point really for the purposes of this session because on the one hand we are very forceful advocates of child safety and on the other some of the positions that we've taken particularly during covid on certain issues have put us i would say really at the very edge of what has been considered acceptable public discussion so to give you some examples we advocated against school closures right at the beginning of the pandemic before it was trendy to do so um, we did the same again when masks were introduced in the classroom and probably most controversially we questioned whether the COVID vaccine should be rolled out to otherwise healthy children. Um, and I think, you know, I guess for our sins, we have been on the receiving end of, um, you know, censorship and cancellation, obviously most recently with PayPal gate, obviously Toby and Free Speech Union as well. Um, and I guess my observation from that point of view would be that often I think there's a tendency to pit free speech against child safety. In fact, that's the way that the debate today is very much framed. I don't see it like that. I see free speech as absolutely essential for child safety. And actually, it was really telling that some of the organisations that PayPal attempted to assassinate were actually the ones um, really taking the strongest positions on child safety. So there was us for them, there was Free Speech Union, I know they've been, you know, been very strong on kind of particularly trans um, it's transgender ideology, and there was an organisation in the States as well um, who had similarly taken um, a very strong position on child safeguarding. So I think from that point of view, it's a bit of a false dichotomy, and you know, I, I share, I'm sure others will talk in more detail, I share many of the concerns um, with the limitations on free speech that will potentially be introduced with some of the provisions of the Online Safety Bill. And I guess maybe just one 
one observation on the free speech side of things is that you know it's sobering to think that if if the bill were to go through Parliament in its current format with these very wide legal but harmful provisions still in, I very much doubt actually that there would have been an us for them because you know I think one or other of our campaign positions would have just been seen as too risky for executives in these tech platforms to to tolerate. Um, that said, I don't think there's any doubt that the online world and particularly social media is a very, very harmful place for children and that it is desperately in need of a new approach. Um, we hear less controversy actually about the child safety aspects of the online safety bill. And that concerns me a bit because it, uh, looking at it, um, my and I, I used to be a lawyer, so I was a lawyer for about 10 years before I was for them, and kind of with that legal hat on, um, it is, you know, however noble the intent of this legislation, it is riddled, I think, with issues from a child safety point of view as well as a free speech point of view. So I think the first thing, I don't know if anyone's got a copy of it here, is just the length. I mean, it is a staggeringly complex piece of legislation that is trying to do lots of different things. And again, with an ex-legal hat on, um, you know, very complex law tends to make for law that is not easily followable, it's not easily enforceable. And we haven't even had the voluntary codes of practice that are going to be issued under the bill yet, so that will add different layers to the complexities. Um, in very broad terms, what the bill tries to do is it includes a new, as we've seen, wide duty of care on tech companies to remove harmful content and in some cases to prevent children from coming into contact with that content at all. Um, the, I mean, we could probably spend a whole session on the kind of technical legal issues, but we'd all be bored to death, so I, I won't do that. But I think really the the overriding concern I have around those technical legal issues is the degree of wiggle room given to tech companies. So, you know, the bill is caveated in many places with a proportionality test and, and you know, these tech companies do not act in the interests of children and there are many places that they will be able to hide under the bill. Um, however, my kind of bigger concern is just stepping back to me, it's stepping back from it, and you know, however noble the bill is, and I'm not for a moment, by the way, suggesting that the child safety provision shouldn't go through, it's, it's the only thing we have at the moment to bolster children's safety, and I think it's important they do go through. But um, it seems to me that the bill is rather based upon a flawed assumption. And the, the assumption the bill makes, essentially, is that whilst some content, and in particular its algorithmic mode of very addictive delivery, is problematic from a child safety point of view, actually social media per se is not harmful. Um, and I would dispute that. Um, you know, I think if we take stock of where we are as a society, we have a terrible mental health crisis among our young people and that is getting worse. It is, it is often blamed on the pandemic and there is an element of truth to that. You know, it's, it certainly got worse, but actually many of the problems have been getting worse for years. Um, we have a mountain of evidence um, pointing to the fact that screens and in particular social media pose very significant risk factors in that mental health crisis. And there, there's a very powerful book, I don't know if some of you may have read it, it's called Glow Kids by Nicholas Cardaris. And he's, he goes through all the evidence about screens and um, the online world and social media and how bad it is for children. And I have to say, reading it for the first time, I was absolutely appalled. And there's just a couple of quotes I wanted to pull out. So he says, an ever increasing amount of clinical research correlates screen tech with psychiatric disorders like ADHD, addiction, anxiety, depression, increased aggression, and even psychosis. He talks extensively about tech addiction, which is seen particularly with boys in gaming and girls, social media, Pinterest, um, Instagram. He says, brain imaging studies conclusively show that ex excessive screen exposure can neurologically damage a young person's developing brain in the same way that cocaine addiction can. And I guess my question here is, you know, leaving aside the pernicious algorithms which undoubtedly make the problem worse, you know, if 
we were coming to this new, would we actually want social media in our children's lives? And I'm amazed by how many parents say to me, you know, I wish I'd never introduced my child to social media, I wish it didn't exist, oh, but it's the way of the world and we have to accept it. And I guess the question really for people in this room, the thing to leave you with is, well, do we have to accept it? Because there comes a point at which a product is so inherently harmful to children, and I'm not talking about adults, that's so inherently harmful to children, you actually think, you know, all this mountain of paperwork and the attempt to regulate and bolstered up powers to Ofcom, which are going to be problematic from a free speech point of view, you know, is there an alternative? And we heard a little bit from Andrew Walker, the coroner in the Molly Russell case, and he talked about the need for a separate social media platform for children. I would actually go further than that, and I would pose the question, you know, is it time we think about whether social media should be allowed in children's lives at all? Or perhaps is it appropriate to allow it in children's lives, but only with absolutely mandatory parental supervision? So every time a child under 16 gets an account, the parent gets one too. And these are questions that I think are really important to ask, and I just haven't heard anyone really ask the question. We seem to be assuming that social media is here to stay, and very excessive, onerous regulation for children is the way forward. So I just leave you with that question as we go into the debate. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Right, over to Toby. Thanks. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Um, just to say in response to what um, Robert and Molly have said, if the bill Charles. when it sorry, Charles, mm -hmm. if the bill when it comes back is is called the Children's Online Safety Bill, then I think there are there are issues that we could discuss in connection with that, but certainly as a free speech advocate I'd be much less concerned um, about a children's online safety bill, which was just designed to protect children from harm online. I wanted to talk about what the word safety means in the title of the bill, Online Safety Bill. Um, and I think what it means is um, uh, the bill will protect users, including adult users of the internet, from harm. So it introduces a new duty on in scope social media providers to, quote, mitigate and manage the risks of harms to individuals. Um, uh, and um, that, on the face of it, sounds okay. I mean, it, it sounds like it's consistent with J.S. Mill's harm principle, which I'll remind you was the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Um, but I think the, the, the problem is that what the government what the drafters of the bill in its current form um, have in mind by harm is not just physical harm, but psychological harm as well. So the bill is effectively saying that the state um, has a responsibility to protect adults, not just children, from psychological harm. And therefore it's going to task Ofcom with making sure that... Uh, in-scope providers don't cause psychological harm to users. And that's absolutely um, uh, clear from the new harmful communications offence. Uh, so one of the things the bill is going to do, which isn't often discussed in connection with this bill, is it's going to repeal uh, Section 127 of the Communications Act and the Malicious Communications Act. So the offences in those bits of legislation are repealed and replace them with a new harm-based communications offence. Um, and uh, one of the things the harm-based communications offence will protect people from is extreme distress. So if in future, if this clause remains in the bill and it becomes law, if you suffer extreme distress as a result of reading something online um, and various other tests are met as well, then the person responsible for posting that thing, which has caused extreme distress, is um, can, can be imprisoned for up to two years in jail. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm very nervous about the introduction of this idea that if something you read online causes you extreme distress, it's very subjective. There's no kind of clinical test attached to it. 
Um, psychologists don't have to be consulted to determine whether someone has been caused extreme distress. There doesn't seem to be much in the way of allowance for, well, how fragile and mentally unwell is the person who's caused extreme distress by the communication. So it introduces this vague, um, uh, catch-all and very subjective concept into the criminal law, perhaps not for the first time, but it certainly embeds the idea further, I think, in law, assuming it passes unchanged, that it is the responsibility of the state to protect people from various forms of psychological harm, and that psychological harm should be ranked alongside physical harm as something we all need to be kept safe from. Um, and this is also implicit in the more controversial and much more widely discussed element of the bill, which is the Clause 13, the stuff dealing with content that is legal but harmful to adults, which may or may not go. Um, I hope Charles is right and it does go, but it may not. Um, and um, one of the complicating things about discussing what the government has in mind by content that's legal but harmful to adults um, which um, it wants the Inscope social media providers to address in their terms and conditions, um, is that there isn't much in the bill uh, setting out the content um, of that kind. Rather, it's going to be set out in a statutory instrument supplementary to the bill. Um, and the government has published an indicative list of what will appear in that statutory instrument. Um, uh, it published it in July, so this is before the change of government. Um, and it included online abuse and harassment, um, which I think is worrying, and again strays into the territory of psychological harm being something that um, uh, the state has a responsibility to protect internet users from, and some health and vaccine misinformation and disinformation, which, um, as many of us know, um, uh, is often invoked as a reason for removing content from social media platforms. Um, so um, uh, embedded in the bill is this notion um, that um, we need to be protected from things that are psychologically harmful. Um, and even though in the indicative list that the government has published already of the content that's legal but harmful to adults, there are various um, caveats. So it says, for instance, about... Um, uh, prohibiting health and vaccine misinformation and disinformation, that that is not intended to capture genuine debate. So the government is clearly, and, and, and there are various things in this bill, um, uh, clearly designed to appease, placate uh, the kind of free speech lobby. Other things too, like um, protection of content of democratic importance, protection of journalistic content and so forth. We can discuss all that. I think a lot of them are very problematic for different reasons we won't get into here. Um, but um, one risk of the bill is that, okay... The um, statutory instrument, which includes the list of content that's lawful but awful, is one way it's been described, legal but harmful to adults, um, may, may not be too draconian, too censorious, uh, if it's brought in by the current culture secretary, Michelle Donnelly. But it's a hostage to fortune because it, could, it can be added to by future governments. So there's nothing to prevent a future Labour culture secretary um, bringing in their own list, their own, com their own list of content that is harmful to adults. And the reason I'm worried about this idea that we need to be protected from psychological harm and this, this concept being further embedded in law is that I know from um, defending people's right to free speech, participating in debates like this at universities up and down the country, that, that this concept that certain words, certain ideas, merely hearing things you find disagreeable or offensive is a palpable, tangible form of harm that people need to be protected from, whether it's protected by the state or institutions like universities. Um, this is the main threat to free speech, this idea that people need safe spaces, that if they're going to be introduced to the work of Chaucer or even J.K. Rowling, uh, they need to be provided with trigger warnings because reading certain, certain things being introduced to certain ideas is so psychologically traumatic, it's a species of harm that we have a duty to protect them from. I'm very nervous that th this great, this, this kind of perversion of Mill's harm principle, which I think is the principal enemy of free speech and the reason so much free speech is shut down across our institutions, if that's embedded in law, as it will be in the current iteration of the online safety bill, the job of people who want to preserve free speech, preserve the idea that discussing 
difficult, contentious ideas in the public square has enormous civic value and is an essential part of democracy, we're going to be we're going to, our battle is going to be that much harder because we will be legally prevented from causing extreme distress and so on and so forth. So that, that's my main concern with the bill. It, it underlines and embodies in law what is the central pillar of the kind of anti-free speech establishment. Right. Thanks very much. <laughs> Now, Paddy. Thanks. Um, I think obviously the internet has posed as a problem for, well, I don't know about all of us, but a lot of people, um, children and adults. Um, it's something that sort of came out of nowhere, um, but it grew with a kind of mass public participation. And on the one hand, it has us more interconnected, um, more able to organise political campaigns, social campaigns and all the rest of it, and to keep up relationships perhaps that would have collapsed otherwise. Um, but at the same time, people seem to feel more atomized, more isolated than ever, uh, and more vulnerable than ever. And, and that's where I think this idea of harm is coming from. I don't think uh, anybody on this panel, or hopefully in the audience, would deny that there are some quite serious dangers on the internet. And I actually agree that there are some dangers that we've signally failed to tackle, and the government is many, many years behind on that uh, issue. Um, and there is a debate to be had about the value of the internet in our lives, uh, which is a very interesting debate, although I fear somewhat academic because it's here and I don't think it's going away. And, you know, I'd be interested to talk later about the issue of, of children's access to the internet. But certainly for adults, I don't think there's anything that can be done to stop people using it. But as with so many of these issues um, in the public sphere, the anxiety, the desire to protect people, I think something that started out as quite a positive thing, a genuine sort of empathy for people who are suffering, has slowly morphed, whether intentionally or otherwise, into an increasingly paternalistic, controlling, uh, authoritarian, intolerant uh, outlook on speech, on politics and on life. And now we've seen that in all kinds of issues. Um, obviously, I mean, COVID is the obvious example recently, but I think more illustrative perhaps than anything else is some of the more absurd moralistic restrictions that came in like the scotch egg rule and the 10 p.m curfew which we all had to live with but uh, seemed just baffling and, and completely unscientific but obviously informed by some kind of idea that you know people are going to get drunk and they'll be dangerous to each other and themselves but there's other there's other things like the sugar tax um campaigns are growing across the world including this country to ban smoking um, I've never smoked, but I, it, in my childhood, I would have found it absolutely staggering to think that anybody would ever argue that that was a legitimate thing for a government to do. But here we are, and it's happening. Um, and now it's in the online safety bill. Um, I work in the House of Commons, and I've also worked as a journalist, so I kind of come at this from two perspectives, one of which is more journalistic and one of which is legislative. And I have to say that the bill alarms me on both counts. Um, I think the issue is summed up, we've, we've talked a bit about illegal but harmful and also this, this phrase, the duty of care. I think that sums up the main problem with this bill. There are a lot of problems with it. But the main one is this idea that the state has a role that goes beyond saying what is legal and, what, and, and has a role in saying what is moral, what is good. Um, I think this is reflected in the fact that the whole concept of legal but harmful is a reflection of, partly of, of cowardice on the parts of people who've come up with it because if they don't think something should be allowed, they should make it illegal, but they know that they can't get that through Parliament because it would be such a barefaced insult to freedom of speech. So they've dressed it up as something which is going to be sort of slightly restrictive. We're not going to say quite how it's going to be restrictive, but it's not going to be illegal, but you could be punished for it, right? So I think that that's quite pernicious, I have to say. I don't mean to be too aggressive about the people who support this bill, because I think there's many, many good people who support this bill, and there are good reasons to support parts of this bill. And I don't think that everybody supports it for authoritarian reasons, but I think that all the input that's come together has resulted in, in, in a bit of a monster of a bill. The, we've discussed about uh, the power this bill is going to give the government. The first draft of the bill um, was even worse. It has improved to give the government or the previous government some credit. But we've still got a situation where the Secretary of State effectively will be able to determine what is legal but harmful and therefore what is allowed to say online. Um, we've discussed... Um, Charles mentioned how it, this should be done in a parliamentary, in, in a wider parliamentary discussion, deciding what is on what counts as legal but harmful. I agree with that. I'd go beyond saying a joint committee and say let's just have the debate in the House of Commons every year. Mm -hmm. I don't see any reason why we couldn't um, have an honest discussion that way. 
Um, and I think I mentioned that this bill sort of offends me from a journalistic and a legislative perspective. I think the other reason, particularly on the legislative side, is that I have got a sense, particularly from people in government pushing the bill, particularly the previous Secretary of State, Nadine Dorries, that they don't actually understand what the bill is going to do <laughs> or what its contents are. Um, I work for an MP who was quite prominently opposed to the bill, and we were told the response we got when we raised concerns was, read the bill. Well, I have read, I mean, I'm going to be honest, I haven't read the whole bill because it's ridiculously long, as all forms of restriction on speech tend to be. But I know what it's going to do, um, and I fear that some of the people in government who have pushed it do not realise some of the implications. Uh, so I don't think it takes a sort of active desire to police what people are saying for that to be the ultimate outcome. Um, we've discussed as well, I think obviously the other side of this is, is the role that big tech is going to have in it. And uh, again, the first draft of the bill was more concerning, but it's, the second draft is still a big problem. The record that big tech has when it comes to censorship is, uh, it couldn't be much worse really. So it kind of seems odd to me that any government that purports to be in favour of free speech would ever think about outsourcing or, or trying to get more uh, of a role for big tech in deciding what is acceptable to say and what isn't. And, and although I'm sure there is desire from, I know there's big desire from big tech for clarity on these issues, I think there's also genuine fear among the executives and the people who run these companies who don't want to be, give, be uh, prescribed extremely onerous restrictions telling them that if they don't deal with this content in the right way, and consistently, they could go to prison or be fined, I think it's something like 10% of global revenue, which obviously would be billions and billions of pounds. So the fear from people on, on my side of this is that big, uh, big tech firms won't err on the side of censoring the minimum. They will err on the side of censoring the maximum. Because one of the clauses of this bill is that they have to enforce whatever policy they come up with consistently. So far, what we've had is that big tech enforces its censorship uh, arbitrarily and inconsistently. I think the result of this bill would be that they just censor more people all the time. I think um, the, the point about outsourcing power to the government to decide what's moral is, 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 is the is sort of the wider issue here. And I, I do actually think there's, there's content in the online safety bill and in the online safety debate that does need to be policed. Uh, Charles talks about suicide, self-harm, these sorts of things. I mean, make them illegal, I agree. Um, I don't know why the bill doesn't make them illegal. Why, why are we talking about legal but harmful and not just what's illegal? And having a much smaller level of restrictions on what people can say, but just saying you, you can't you know, encourage people to, to do those sorts of things, that's, that's fine. Um, but I think we do need to have a wider discussion, a wider case for human autonomy and independence, because the, the concept of harm, the concept that it's the role of the government to decide what's moralistic and what is harmful to people but not, legal, not illegal, um, reflects a kind of unwillingness, and not just in government, but I think in wider society, to discuss what the realms of human freedom are, what humans can cope with. And I think it's no coincidence that uh, this bill's support seems to have gone up, although the debate has raised more, following on from COVID and the restrictions that came in there, where it seemed suddenly much more acceptable to determine what was right for other people to do and what was safe for other people to do. I think that's quite a worrying development. Uh, but I'm not entirely pessimistic, because I think we are having more and more discussions actually about thinking, well, actually, the government is, and I say the government as in whoever happens to be in power, can seem so incompetent um, that it's actually going to be, have to be up to us to decide uh, how we live our lives and what our rights are, and we'll have to fight for them regardless of who's in power. Uh, Toby made the good point that uh, this could be a Labour Secretary of State in the future deciding what's legal or harmful. That is terrifying. Equally terrifying, I would say, would have been having Nadine Dorries deciding what, <laughs> what would have been. The, and I say that somebody who works for Conservative MP. So I think, uh, I think the broader case, uh, what, it's absolutely true, that point, but I think there's also the broader case to say uh, I don't want any of these people deciding uh, what I can say online. Thanks very much, Mark. <laughs>
<laughs> and I'm sorry to say, I wish I didn't have to say this, but I'm sorry to say that I'm still of the same view of this bill. Indeed, now um, it's a motorway, I think, with a looming pileup as its deep-seated design flaws have become ever more visible. Now, the narrative, and we've heard that in um, some of the presentations you've just heard, is that this is all about major social media platforms and their algorithms. But I think we do have to remember that the core provisions of this bill, most of this bill, apply to an estimated 25,000 UK user-to-user uh, -user service providers, search engines, from the largest to the very smallest. It applies to your local neighborhood watch forum as much as it applies to Twitter or Facebook or any of the others. And it applies regardless of whether a platform uses algorithms, simply providing the facilitation for people to talk to each other online takes it within the bill. So let's be clear about what we're actually talking about here. This isn't just about the big platforms. This isn't even mainly about the big platforms. The core provisions go far, far wider than that. And we can't doubt that at its core, the bill is born of good intentions. There are real issues about online safety. They've been around for years, and you can't blame a government for wanting to address them. But we do have to look not at what it says on the tin, but what's inside the tin. And I'm afraid that when you open this tin, what we find is a can full of worms. And I mentioned three reasons why I think this is. Firstly, you've already heard about the duty of care. The offline traditional legal concept of the duty of care works very well for physical injury and risk of physical injury. It works well for unguarded circular sores, for broken paving slabs and so on. It doesn't work for speech. The tweet is not a tripping hazard. It's something that, uh, that requires subjective opinion as to whether or not it is harmful. Physical injury is objective and that kind of assessment is not. And if you try to legislate as if a tweet were a tripping hazard, I'm afraid you end up in exactly the freedom of speech morass in which this government now finds itself. It is no coincidence that the government is in this mess. It was inevitable that it would be, find itself in this mess once it went down this path. I'm afraid if you go down that sort of route, your attempt to clean up the internet risks creating a sterile internet and the casualty is lawful, legitimate speech at mass scale. Even if that is the unintended consequence, it is the predictable consequence. We've heard a bit about the harmful communications offence, um, the standard of serious distress. Indeed, you don't have, for the harmful communications offence, you don't even have to show that anyone is seriously distressed. All that is required is that it's reasonably foreseeable that someone in the likely audience may suffer, is likely to suffer serious distress. One person is enough, and there's no requirement that that reaction be reasonable. That is why the, um, there is the concern that the harmful communications offence um, risks enacting a veto for the most readily distressed. And when you add to that, not just the commission of the offence, but that the platforms will be required to a judge whether uh, they can reasonably infer that there is a risk of that offence taking place, you are then in the area uh, potentially of quite arbitrary um, requirements being placed on platforms. And it is for that kind of reason, and that is in connection with the illegality duty, which many people think is, is quite reasonable, but even in the context of the illegality duty, that's where you end up and you end up with the risk of massive over-removal of legitimate speech. And there is a question here, how much legitimate speech are you prepared to sacrifice in your quest to slay the internet dragon? And for that matter, how much privacy are you prepared to sacrifice when you look at things like um, the, 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 the potential rules about end-to-end -end encryption and so on? I'm not sure there is any consensus on that. Also, if you think the rules should be different, that there are harms that are not currently uh, illegal 
that should be either made illegal or restrained in some way. The question I would always pose is, fine, what rule are you proposing? Where is the line that you want to draw? And if you're not able to do more than say, we know it when we see it, if we're not, we're not able to say, not just this is what should fall within it, but this is possibly quite unpleasant stuff that shouldn't be suppressed, then you're not making a rule. There is a rule of law issue, and I would say you don't get to make that rule. Um, it is the traditional approach to protection of freedom of speech um, is the rule of law one, that you make laws um, that allow someone to predict with reasonable certainty in advance of their action which side of the line their action will be. If what you are um, creating, intentionally or not, is a system that is based on arbitrary, ad hoc, subjective assessment, then you fail the rule of law test. I would also say uh, something about broadcast style regulation. This is discretionary broadcast style regulation by Ofcom. Um, it's presented as being about regulating platforms. In reality, it's about instrumentalizing platforms to regulate what you and I, the users of the internet, can say online. Offline, we govern individual speech with clear and certain general laws, not by the moving hand of a broadcast regulator's rule book. Uh, Ofcom isn't looking over our shoulder when we walk down the street talking to each other. And broadcast regulation in the offline world is the exception, not the rule. Thirdly, I'll say something about upload filtering. The bill requires proactive prevention of illegality, uh, meaning criminal offences, uh, priority criminal offences, and providers using their algorithms will have to predict the kinds of arguably illegal content that might appear on their platforms in the future, put systems in place to prevent or mitigate it. This is almost putting us in the territory of algorithmic determination of pre-crime. Looked at from traditional freedom of speech um, perspective, it reverses the presumption against prior restraint that something should not be taken down um, uh, 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 without due process um, and without it being without a very high standard to decide that it is um, illegal. It's a core element of traditional offline freedom of speech protections long before anyone had heard of the Convention on Human Rights or the Human Rights Act. Criminal offences were designed to be enforced by public prosecutors and courts making considered decisions in the light of all the available evidence, not by arbitrary guesswork uh, required to be undertaken by platforms filtering out algorithms operating under the Act in real time uh, on the basis of inevitably inadequate information. We don't want platforms to be arbiters of truth, yet, according to the bill, we do want them, or might more likely their algorithms, to act as, for instance, judges of the public interest. Uh, Chris Philp, who was then the minister, uh, was talking about the harmful communications offence. He said the platform would perform a balancing exercise in assessing whether the con content was a contribution to a matter of public interest. That is the kind of assessment that the, the platforms will be required to make. Going back to the physical injury, you, know, you don't have to do a balancing exercise to determine whether a broken arm is or isn't a physical injury. This is why applying this kind of duty of care concept to complex legal constructs um, of criminal offences and to non-physical injury creates such problems for freedom of speech. What should we do? Um, I have a long list, but I've run out of time, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, a couple of things. First, I think it is an enormous mistake to think that if we take out the lawful but harmful to adults duty, that will fix the bill. The problems are much more deep-seated than that. And I would say, if we're going to have an online safety bill, make it about safety, properly so-called risk of physical injury. And if we want to protect children, make it about children. Thank you very much. <laughs>
the, the point that was just made there at the end as well about let's make it about children. Um, because I do think that's the beachhead uh, that, that, is the, uh, that opens up the whole thing. Because I think it's hard to argue against duty of care just about adults, uh, but accept that there's some kind of um, premise that this technology and these platforms do cause harm and are instigators of, of harm uh, to children. So um, the phrase that you used, Charles, was like suicide-enabling platforms or something. I think we just really have to push back on that, that idea that kids are killing themselves because of this platform. That doesn't mean we're unsympathetic to the, to the Molly Russell case or any of these things, and we're not unsympathetic to Molly here, what, you know, the, the situation that pa parents are in trying to navigate these things, navigate these things for their children. But the idea that a, uh, using Instagram or something is the cause of suicide, I think we, we've just got to push back on that. Um, the idea that a coroner can be uh, coming to those conclusions and then putting us all on the back foot and we all say, oh, well, therefore we must do something about these platforms. I think we've got to pull the rug from under that um, and say that there is no direct cause. I mean, if there was, surely the suicide rates would have gone up over the last decades as the internet gained hold around the world. But that's not the case. It isn't the case that more children are killing themselves. So I think you have to kind of stop this beachhead. I'm using lots of metaphors here, pulling rugs. You know, but the, uh, you have to kind of really nip this whole thing right at its root because then the whole thing about duty of care, psychological harm, which you, you Toby, very well explained, Chaucer, universities, all of these things are built on this kind of premise that there's somehow a cause and effect here uh, from this technology. Thank you. I just want to make the point that um, will we sort of be in a situation where internet companies ask us, um, are we prone to distress? Because, you know, they may say, well, tick this box if you're not likely to get distressed. Um, so that would be something interesting anyway. So I hope this is not on off, off, the, uh, off the page, but uh, well, um, uh, if we're going to have a bill of protecting children, why isn't there a Rochdale bill? I'm not a lawyer, but I did read um, most of the 200 and odd pages of this bill, and it sent me into somewhat of a logical quandary, really. I mean, if something is legal but harmful and is made illegal, then how can that be legal but harmful? <laughs> also, this is an old area of law which comes under common law um, in reality and is therefore a tort, but it's made into criminal law. And the balance of probabilities, which applies to, uh, sorry, to um, common law, to a tort, uh, is being transferred, uh, is, sorry, the other way around, um, a, a criminal um, situation where you have to have beyond reasonable doubt, that is being downgraded into a situation where you're looking at a balance of probabilities, but not even that, because as, as, as the uh, chap on the end there said, it, it, the test is even less than that. So this sets a precedent, not just for this area of law, surely, and there's, there's better legal minds there, uh, obviously, than me, but surely it sets a precedent whereby, you know, at all can be, uh, that test can be applied to criminal law and therefore people can be criminalised under very low tests of, 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 uh, of criminality. It, it just, you know, is a nightmare. Molly, I was sympathetic to your argument about needing to protect children um, because I think we can all understand that social media can be very harmful. We understand about peer pressure and we know just how stroppy teenagers can be. But having said all of that, um, isn't there a problem with your argument which I think is intended to support parental responsibility but by invoking the state into the relationship between parents and children, I fear that you would end up weakening it. Because the problems that you've addressed, no matter how difficult they are to deal with, ultimately have to be ones for parents to deal with. And you can only help parents to do that if you make it clear to everyone that this is simply a relationship between parent and child and that the state is not going to be involved. Very good. So I'm going to come back to the panel. Um, 
just for a, some responses, you can pick the, the children point, which obviously is coming up very strongly here, but also the other, issue, the other question about does this actually create legal precedents, will actually have a knock-on effect on other areas of law? And then the very interesting question on the Rochdale question, which is, you know, why do we think this can work when we've failed in other areas to uh, police and uh, criminalise very, very obvious uh, harmful behaviour? Charles? Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's as, as though... We think that 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 the that, that nobody else, we, we the users, are controlling what happens to the internet. Of course, that's really important. But the people who are really controlling what's happening on the internet, the way it's privatised, the way it's disseminated, are the platforms. And as I said, it's really chaotic. And both the way that the algorithms run, they don't even know what the algorithms are doing in many cases. And one of the hopes is that though they'll be forced to try and find out what the hell's happening with the algorithms, what the effects of those are, is to try and put it on a, a basis where they aren't just, the platforms just aren't left to themselves to make these decisions, which as I said, are very often, um, you know, it, uh, the result of all sorts of random lobbying by people who have access to the executives and to try and get some sort of, uh, some sort of regulation out that chaos. Um, on the, on the, the, the psychological um, front that uh, Toby raised, I, th I think absolutely there must be a right to offend people. It's a central part of our democracy. And I think that the, the threshold for psychological harm in this bill is far too is low. There needs to be a psychologist probably involved in it. But it is possible to cause psychological harm on the internet, both to children and to adults. And the, the, the gentleman at the back there talked about suicide naming websites. Maybe children don't go on to, or could don't go on to, to, to websites, those sort of websites, and think, good heavens, I must go and commit suicide. But if they are in the mood, they want to go and commit suicide, it does help to enable them to go and do it. You talk to, and when it comes to children being stopped from doing that, of course they must be stopping there. You know, most parents don't even know what their children are doing on the internet. You talk to any teachers or many parents, they haven't a clue what the, what the children are doing. I and mean, we, we try and stop children watching you know, films that we don't think that they should be exposed to. Why shouldn't we try and protect children and, and try and help parents protect children from things that are going to cost, uh, cause them psychological harm? You talk to any of the anorexia website um, charities or the self-harm charities, they are really, really concerned. There is an epidemic of self-harm going on amongst teenagers in this country. It is inspired by people um, looking on the internet and, 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 uh, and seeing other children doing it and thinking, oh, that looks a cool way of getting attention. I don't know what their motivation is, but the fact is that it, it, is, it is stirring, it is encouraging um, them both to be psychologically harmed and to be physically harmed. And if we have a way of trying to, to dial that down, to try and to make to make this incredibly powerful, incredibly important, and also incredibly useful medium safer, particularly for our children, then surely we're duty bound to do that. Thank you, Charles. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, so picking up, and Charles has helpfully covered a few of the points I would have addressed, but I think picking up on two points. The first is this idea that we need to push back against the idea that, you know, Instagram is a cause of suicide. And, you know, I, I don't dispute that proving direct and exclusive causation is hard. And, in fact, that's not what the coroner in the Molly Russell case said. He said it was a contributing factor. I think, though, it is indisputable that um, social media and screens are known to have really detrimental impacts on children. And it's not clear looking at the evidence that we're talking here about something that has a net positive um, you know, effect on children. Like, yes, sure, there are benefits of social media and of screens, but actually I do think we have to ask whether those benefits are outweighed by the harms, and it's not clear to me that they are. Um, and I think then just picking up on the parent-child relationship point as well, and the gentleman that raised that, I mean, I think ordinarily I would absolutely agree with that, and, you know, I think we all recoil a bit, or many of us do, we think about the state intruding into our lives and into that relationship. I think the practicality um, in the online world of parents meaningf meaningfully controlling what their kids are doing, as Charles said, is virtually impossible. And there are various reasons for that. I mean, the first is that parents just don't have access. At the moment, they're not allowed access to the kids' accounts, so they can't control. Second is that children are very often more tech-savvy than the parents. So actually, the parents will put a blocker on, and the kids get around that. 
The third is that the, the reality of peer-to-peer -peer relationships means that if you are a parent trying to control your child from using whatever it is, WhatsApp or not being on Instagram, but actually all the other kids in class are doing it, you are opening your child up to um, you know, uh, certainly being left out and actually worse than that, being bullied for not being on these platforms. And then actually the fourth reason why I think it's really, really difficult is because of the role of schools. We've not really talked about, you know, where schools are in terms of using tech and encouraging kids to um, digitise, I guess, their education. But I think this is quite a... You know, it's an area we'll probably talk a lot about because actually it's not ideal when schools are using and encouraging these platforms to then at home have to say, oh, actually, no, you can't use screens. You know, I had this with my six-year-old six -year -old yesterday, in fact, came home asking for the iPad so she could play a game. I said, no, you're not allowed to do that. And she says, but it's my homework. And, you know, she was right. It was her homework. It was literally a computer game. And you just think this just goes against everything as a parent that I've tried to teach. And I think we saw that to an extreme during the pandemic when obviously everything that we tried to teach our kids about not using mobile phones and not being dependent on it went out of the window because it was suddenly, oh, go and sit in your room isolated with your mobile phone. So I think this is a case. And, you know, I keep coming back to the example of cigarettes where there just wasn't a sufficient net benefit to mean that there was any appropriate course of action other than to remove them from children's lives. And I know, it's, I know it sounds extreme, and I know that many people won't agree with it, but that is the kind of product I think we are talking about here. Interesting, thank you. Uh, Toby. <clears throat> and just one clarification. Um, content that promotes self-harm, anorexia, and suicide isn't just on the indicative list of content <coughs> that's legal but harmful to children. It's on the indicative list of content that's legal but harmful to adults. So content promoting self-harm, anorexia, and suicide is something the government, as it stands, want to protect adults from, not just children. Um, on your point that the first gentleman to speak made about, well, he has many reservations about um, an online, sorry, a, a children's online safety bill. I mean, I think pragmatically that battle has been lost politically. Um, I think it's now politically inevitable, whether under this government or the next, that a law will be passed designed to protect children, at the very least, from online harm. <coughs> the battle as I see it that's being fought now is to prevent um, uh, mission creep, to prevent people using the argument that we need to protect children from online harm to justify all these other measures in the bill which go way beyond that and restrict free speech. Um, so I might have some sympathy for those who think that actually there are various dangers associated with an, a children's online safety bill. I think pragmatically, We've lost that battle, and we just have to make sure we don't lose any more. But I wanted to flag up one risk. If, if, if the bill does come back as a children's online safety bill, I just wanted to flag up one risk associated with that, which is that presumably part of the, 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 the bill will contain huge incentives for social media companies um, uh, not to allow children to be exposed for content that's only suitable for adults. So I would have thought that if an online, if a children's online safety bill is passed, all the major social media platforms and other, other internet service providers too, um, will, um, as, as a matter of default, include safety settings whereby that unless you change them, the only content you can see on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, any, any content you can see provided by your internet service provider, whether it's BT or Virgin, will be content that's suitable for people of all ages, less a child inadvertently stumble across content that's only suitable for adults. The risk with that is, well, who gets to decide what content is suitable for people of all ages and what content needs to be flagged as only suitable for adults? Well, I can tell you, in some cases, it'll be the British Board of Film Classification. And they don't have a great track record in this area because one of the people the Free Speech Union came to the defense of recently is a magazine called The Conservative Woman. The Conservative Woman discovered that it was being blocked by O2, Vodafone, 
uh, EE, and the reason it was being blocked is because on those mobile service providers, the default settings are the safe settings. So content that's only suitable for adults, you can't view on your phone if you're with one of those three companies, unless you change the settings. Um, and that's because the British Board of Film Classification decided that the content of the conservative woman was only suitable for adults. And that is a risk, I think, even if the bill is stripped down and becomes a children's online safety bill, it'll mean that certain political content, not all political content, they didn't block the new statesman or the canary, they only blocked the conservative woman, some political content for seemingly arbitrary, you know, entirely subjective reasons will be designated as only suitable for adults. So unless you know, unless you're, you can list your kids to change the default settings, you're going to be stuck with only being able to read very anodyne content, even on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Thanks, Toby. Uh, um, Paddy? Uh, yeah, so just picking up on this point about suicide, self-harm, anorexia, that sort of thing, um, I think the gentleman who raised that made, made a good point, and that I'm sure there's a very interesting discussion to be had about you know, what's driving kids to self-harm and commit suicide, and, and, and adults, actually, as well. Um, and, and we could have a very interesting discussion about that. I don't think that necessarily means that we shouldn't do, do something with the law about it, at least as regards children, um, because even if the internet, you know, is playing a pretty minor role and it's only a few kids, I mean, that's still a few kids' lives, isn't it? Um, so I think there's still some space there. And I think that feeds into the wider point. Toby mentioned the fact about this, parts of this political argument having already been lost to some extent, at least in the legislative sphere. I would like, probably, <coughs> like them to can the whole online safety bill and then put through some smaller bills for the bits of it which are salvageable, but that's not politically realistic. Governments don't just can entire bills that they've spent years uh, researching, supporting, etc., etc. It's about making something that is at least damaging as possible. That seems to be what politics is about these days, turning laws into things that aren't absolutely terrible. Um, that may be a bit of a depressing point, but I, I fear that that is, that is simply the case uh, these days. So it's a, you know, the debate is more about how can we turn the online safety bill into something less offensive. Um, but the, the suicide point also reminded me of something that happened, uh, I think it was today or yesterday, it was the first anniversary of the death of David Amos. Um, within days, weeks of him dying, there was a large campaign for what has been called David's Law, uh, this campaign about needing the state to be more active in stopping social media abuse and so on. And although the ostensible cause is that I'm told David Amos was concerned about social media abuse, although it doesn't really tell you anything because I think everybody is concerned about social media abuse, it became about, oh, an Islamist has murdered a member of parliament, so we need to police speech on the internet. I thought, what, there's, I cannot see any connection whatsoever between those things. And, I'm, you know, it, it alarmed me somewhat that, uh, that somebody's death was being sort of utilised in that way. Uh, just quickly, on the, on the Rochdale point, I think, I mean, I think we all know, to be honest, the reasons why Islamist group, Islam, uh, Muslim grooming gangs were not dealt with in the way that they should have been. Um, but I think the broader point about why we didn't do something about that, but we are doing something about online safety, is that people have got the misconception that it's easy to deal with online safety. Um, we didn't want to deal with Rochdale and other grooming gang situations because it was rather complicated um, for different reasons. And the similar situation seems to be happening. Uh, should, uh, when it comes to online safety, we seem to have got this misconception that it's, it's much easy, really, really easy to deal with these things. It doesn't strike me that it is. I think once you start... Uh, really start trying to police what people say online and trying to restrict access to what people have online, you find that uh, the laws have unintended consequences and anyway the intended consequences are not achieved. We talked obviously about children's access to the internet and it, it does to some considerable extent worry me that uh, children's or childhood has been, has been damaged to some extent by, by social media and I, I say that as somebody who sort of became, well, well, I was kind of a teenager when social media really started becoming a big thing. Um, but again, forgive me for being pessimistic, I really don't think there's much we can do in terms of the law to stop kids accessing social media. I just don't think it can be achieved. There are little things you can do, you can, you know, there's debates about age verification and things like that. But when it comes to actual state uh, power, as opposed to what parents can do, I really don't think any law sort of banning children from access to social media is, I think it's a non-starter. Just to um, chip in, there was, um, I 
couldn't find it after I'd initially read the headline, but there was a study out, or a bit of research out the week before last, which was uh, the number of parents who are the ones actually helping their children divert around age regulations <laughs> was incredibly high. And I do think there's some bigger discussion to be had about adults actually being prepared to say no. Uh, and that's, that is a very tricky one. So you know, even things like suicide and self-harm, it's culturally prevalent and glamorized in teenage culture generally whether that's on social media or whether that's in Hollywood films or Netflix series or wherever that might be. Even um, I went to a GCSE dance show <laughs> and there was a highly aestheticized representation of a, a teenager hanging themselves in the kind of culmination of the evening of a GCSE dance show. And none of the staff had thought that this may not be a great wow. thing for teenagers to explore. So I do wonder you know, if we pull back a bit and look at these kind of themes that we're incredibly worried about, whether there's a broader context that might help us understand them, them better. But that, that's me uh, chipping in. Graham. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, someone raised the analogy with common law and tort. Um, and as a lawyer, I'd better pick up on that one. Um, so yeah, if you look at the you know, common law duties of care, what's complicated here is that we're talking about not a two-way, but a three-way situation. Most of what we're talking about here, in fact all, is user to user. It's one user reading something posted by another user. And ordinarily, in the common law, I, if, I, I owe no duty to prevent you from injuring you. Um, it, it, there is no duty of care. And that, of course, does read on to the position of a platform. Does a platform owe a duty of care to prevent um, one user uh, harming another user? Let's use that word. Let's say it's some kind of risk of physical injury, which might be the case with a, a suicide content. However, there are exceptions to that. And the exceptions are that if, that if I have done something which creates or exacerbates that risk, then under the common law, as it stands offline, I can be subjected to some kind of uh, duty of care. It may not be. It might be reactive. It might be preventative. It might not be. You know, it, it, it can vary as to what it is. But there are situations in which that can apply. And I think one of the things we should consider here. Um, and again, the narrative is always about the big algorithmic social platforms. Now, maybe it's arguable that you know, I, 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 I post a tweet. That's my tweet. It's not Twitter's tweet. Um, but once the algorithms get going and the amplification happens and so on, is there an argument that, that is something which, from a common law, traditional common law perspective, could be seen as exacerbating risks where the content in question um, could have a risk of, say, a physical injury? So I, I don't think we should say, we can say that, the com that analogizing with the common law excludes duties of air completely. Uh, so duties of air, duties of care. Um, what, what I do think it means is that a rather more nuanced approach should be taken, and I suspect that that would involve distinguishing, perhaps, for instance, distinguishing between algorithmic promotion and the kind of vanilla uh, provision of, of sites where there is no, um, no promotional alg algorithmic um, operations of that kind by the site. Um, I'd, just something on psychological harm. Um, I always think it's useful, in fact, I would say it's essential when we're talking about these kinds of concepts to, to reduce it to some concrete examples. And this is a peculiarly appropriate venue to raise this one. Um, I, don't think it, I don't think there can be any question that there are, there are people who experience serious distress on encountering blasphemous content. So the question is then, given that that happens, and given therefore that it's foreseeable that people will uh, suffer serious distress, does that mean that the harmful communications offence, for instance, does it introduce blasphemy as a um, by the back door, or doesn't it? And I'm not sure what the answer to that is. The Law Commission, who promoted that bill, placed a lot of emphasis on the fact that, you know, that it would be construed in accordance with freedom of speech, that uh, you had to show um, 
criminal standard of intent and, uh, and that you had to show lack of reasonable excuse. If it was a contribution to a matter of public debate, it wouldn't be blasphemous. But I wonder if that is sufficiently clear to be a comfort to someone who wants to, who is thinking of posting stuff, um, material of that kind um, online. And it is, um, uh, someone also mentioned that the, the criminal standard of proof. The, you know, for the platform, it is going to be, as the bill is currently drafted, it would be a question um, not of whether it is manifestly illegal, not of whether it's beyond reasonable doubt, but of whether it can reasonably be inferred from the material available to it um, that there is an offence. But I should make one correction. Um, I think the, 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 the question from the audience then said, you know, that results in criminalising everyone. It doesn't. We, it doesn't extend the criminal offence. I don't um, create, I, I don't um, commit a criminal offence because a platform has over-moderated. What does happen is my content is taken down. Thank you. Right, we're going to do some over this side now. Hello. Um, this is a question from Molly. I was listening to what you were saying about potentially the most viable course of action for children being to <coughs> sort of pretty much remove social media from their lives. So I'm 19, so I'm probably, I barely remember the internet not existing. I definitely, in fact, I definitely don't remember the internet not existing. I barely remember social media not existing. Um, and so I was wondering, do you not anticipate a certain level of pushback from those of us that have grown up with it? And, you know, I'm not a massive advocate for it, but I've definitely reaped a lot of benefits. You know, I sat my A-levels in COVID and social media, if you used it correctly, it was a lifeline, you know. And we, I, lived, I lived on the other side of Europe as a child and it helped me to keep my native language and country, you know, connected with me and not forget it. It really helps with cohesion between schools. You know, I think that the benefits of social media are so strongly felt by especially us that have never known a world without it. You know, access to news is definitely another important thing. I think that there'd be a lot of pushback from those of us who, sure, maybe no longer count as children, but who remember being children and benefiting. I think that there'd be a lot of rebellion and potentially, you know, a feeling of unfairness and kind of sadness on the behalf of the children who would miss out on it, so to speak, if it were to be completely abolished. Fantastic, thank you. Just a point to the gentleman over there and also a question for, um, I forgot the name, Charles, Charles. Uh, as well. Um, the fact, and I say this as in a caveat, as I'm, I agree with everything Toby has said, I'm a very grateful supporter of uh, the Free Speech Union. However, the evidence that primarily Instagram, but also uh, mainly uh, social media, has enormous, enormous uh, harm on particularly teenage girls is irrefutable. And I refer you to Jonathan Haidt's studies in the subject. Uh, he's published work that uh, tracks the self-harm that teenage girls do, and it has elbowed in uh, unison with the entry of primarily Instagram. So that evidence is just irrefutable. Uh, but I had a question for Charles. You, again, mentioned psychological harm as the priority here to try to avoid. And much of what you have said has offended me today, so what should we do with you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I don't think it's for you to do anything with me, actually. It's, it's surely, surely, uh, surely we're allowed to, to be, we're in a free country, I'm a free man, I can do what I want, it's up to you. What I suggested was that when it came to psychological um, harm, that you involved a, a psychologist in, in deciding what that threshold was, and that so you could get some sort of objectivity into whether the person had been deeply psychologically harmed. I can't remember what the legal expression um, in the bill, the bill um, is, but um, uh, psychologically harmed to the, to the extent that it's, it's going to, to d damage them um, long term. And I think that that seems to be a, a sensible thing to try and stop. And the examples that I gave are self-harm and, uh, and suicide enabling websites. Thanks, John. It strikes me that one of the fundamental root causes of this problem, this debate, is the question of what is a social media platform? Is it a platform like a wall on which anybody can put, say, a post-it note, this is my opinion, or is it actually a publisher? And it seems to me that certainly the big platforms seem to be trying to have things both ways. 
are they responsible as publishers for what their contributors put up, or are they simply enablers for people to publish? Thank you. Uh, hello, I have, I'm a psychiatrist, and <laughs> I can say it is, and I have lost patients and colleagues to suicide. It is a very complex phenomenon, uh, very harmful, but um, one thing that came to my mind in this debate was the way that mental health services for children and adolescents have been decimated. And uh, yes, the easy answer as Paddy said might be going and controlling online, but why don't they, why didn't the government invest in these services and just watch back, so stood back and watched them going down? And uh, that's, and it's interesting you mentioned Nadine Doris, she was the Minister for Mental Health, <laughs> interestingly, and now she's the one who's pushing this bill. Thank you. Hi, I'm a doctor and I deal with mental health issues every day and I'm just wondering what is the psychological test that you are hoping will prove the emotional distress caused online? I, I haven't come across on. One thing that worried me was this kind of idea that um, we and children are all blank slates um, and that whatever comes out of the internet, basically, we act on. And children have very, very rich lives. I mean, school. I'm, I'm a teacher and we teach internet safety very, from a very young age. Um, I had two experiences with my now 18-year-old um, daughter who's at uni doing God knows what. And um, the first experience I had with her was at the age of 14. I said to her, um, what are you doing? Let me see your phone. And she said to me, I'm old enough now for you to say to you, you you're not allowed to see my phone. And I thought about it and I thought, actually, she's got a point. You know, I've taught her how to deal with these issues. Um, she's now old enough and have ha has had enough experience to hopefully get it right. I mean, she probably will and has made mistakes, but hopefully to get it right. The second experience that I'm having at the moment is that I'm texting her all the time, obviously, because she's just left to go to university, and she's not responding at all. <laughs> and I say to her, why aren't you responding? And she says, because I'm out with my friends. I'm not looking at my phone. And I think sometimes we forget that um, one of the problems with the internet is that actually people are too isolated. And um, so they are sitting on their phones too much. I know at half time, I spend much more time on my phone than when I'm at school. And um, I, excuse me, I do think that children have very, very rich lives. And if they are getting on with their lives, then their chances that they're on their phone and looking up this content um, is quite remote. And adults, actually. Great, thank you. I am actually a quite concerned about this bill. I was born and brought up in Yemen and under communism. And the last thing I want to the government to regulate any or bring any law. I personally um, had um, death threat um, in social media because of my work. But I find it is uh, to actually, this bill will kill freedom of speech. Um, everybody have a right to say what they want to say. Um, I think if you are the, trying to protect children, and I think in, in this world now, there's so many things going, it's impossible, you know. But at the same time, if we are protecting the children, so why are we allowing children under 16 to go to transgender? OK, yes. thank you. Bring the panel back for final remarks, really, really brief ones, like a minute. If um, we start with Charles. Uh, yes, I just want to apply to the, the doctor and the, the psychiatrist. Um, about about how on earth you uh, do what what these these thresholds are, how on earth you decide whether there is psychological impact. I'm, I'm, I rather hope that with, by including psychiatrists and medical people, um, people who know about mental health, into this process, when there is an accusation of, of extreme um, psychological distress, that you might be able to give us a, give give some guidance um, to how that uh, that should be applied. Frankly, because I. I yeah, well, what is impossible to decide if somebody's been, it's impossible to decide whether somebody's been seriously psychologically harmed. Right, let's, okay, we're going to whiz through the panel. So Molly. So to the lady that asked the question, I mean, look, I totally understand what you're saying. I guess what I'd say in reply is without wanting to sound at all like Listeros, like just because something's <laughs> controversial doesn't mean you shouldn't try it. In fact, quite often it means maybe you should. And I think... Just picking up on one point you you made, you said um, social media was a lifesaver during the pandemic. And I guess 
What I would say in response to that is I think we see with social media a very similar argument to Zoom and to remote learning, that we have these enabling technologies that allow us maybe to act in ways that we wouldn't otherwise. And I think the pandemic is obviously a really good example because without social media, without remote learning, without Zoom, would we have tolerated lockdown? And I suspect maybe we wouldn't have done. And just because we have these things doesn't mean that actually, you know, the benefit outweighs the harms of them. And I guess just the one final point to finish is reminded me quite a bit what you were saying of how I felt and I was probably a similar age maybe a bit older when they introduced the ban on smoking in public indoor spaces and I remember being so angry about that because I was you know a bit of a social smoker at the time and it was part of our lives like how dare you stop me doing something I want to do and you know there was a social benefit I think in that and I guess just looking back um I, you know, obviously now think that was one of the best things to have happened to me, actually, because it just cut that habit in its tracks. So that would just be my perspective, I guess. Thanks, Molly. Toby? Um, rather than respond to any of those excellent points, I just want to make one final point about the bill. Um, so those areas of law which fetter free speech are, for the most part, um, regionally devolved areas of law. So that created a problem for the government when drafting this bill. What do we do about content which is unlawful in Scotland, but not in the rest of the United Kingdom? Is it realistic to empower Ofcom to threaten YouTube, Facebook, Twitter with fines of up to 10% of their global annual turnover if they don't remove content in England and Wales, um, uh, which is illegal in Scotland? Well, the solution they've come up with um, is if something is unlawful to say in any part of the United Kingdom, then social media companies, in scope companies, will be obliged to remove it everywhere in the United Kingdom. So the Scottish Public Order and Hate Crime Act, uh, Hate Crime and Public Order Act, um, which criminalises many things that we're able to say in the rest of the United Kingdom, it'll be Ofcom's job to make sure that across the UK, you can't say any of those things, not just in Scotland, but anywhere else in the UK as well. So my final thought, if you're not alarmed enough <laughs> about this bill, let me leave you with this thought. It effectively empowers Nicola Sturgeon to be the content moderator for the whole of the UK. I'm now getting red carded, so padding. Sure. Um, yeah, just briefly, I think I'm um, building on some of the points that have been made and the discussion as a whole. Um, I think it's, it's perfectly consistent for us to be very sad about things and not think the state should be doing anything about them or not be doing anything drastic about them. I'm, I am, as I've said, you know, it saddens me to some extent to see kids glued to their phones and, and, and also saddens me to see parents sort of using the iPad as a way of not having to do parenting for an hour and, and so on. Although there's, you know, much, much debate can be had about that. I'm not a parent, so I don't claim to be an expert on that sort of thing. Um, but I think that we, as a guide, as a general principle, you should start from the basis that usually when you create laws about something, it just tends to make things worse. It tends to make things more complicated or create problems that are not expected. Obviously, that's a massive generalisation. And I've said already that I would support some legislation on some of the more egregious examples of the way that the internet can harm people, particularly children. Um, and, and I do think, you know, as well, there is a healthy level of social media that kids can engage in and so on. But generally, generally speaking, the problem with the bill is it equates sadness and badness with uh, the realm of the law and of the government, and I don't think that is appropriate. Well, thanks, Paddy. <laughs> quick, very quick clapping. Uh, Graham. Right, my one minute. Platforms we publishers are red herring. Um, offline, traditionally, we have different types of publishers with different types of liability. Um, you know, a, a book publisher, yes, has strict liability for what they publish. A bookshop, when they distribute, has um, a liability which is almost identical to that of the, of the, the, uh, the platforms that we are talking about. What, is, what has no parallel offline is the positive monitoring and removal obligations that this bill would impose on not just the social media platforms, but the 25,000 in scope um, in, in scope uh, organisations and I just leave with a, a plea let's stop reciting narratives and let's start looking behind the labels thank you